Thank you all for joining us for part two of our series, Species Distribution Modeling with Remote Sensing. My name is Amber McCollum, and I'm providing this training with my colleagues Juan Torres Perez and Zach Benston. Today, we are so happy to be joined by guest speakers from the Wallace team, Erica Johnson, Andrea Pazvelez, and Mary Blair. Before we get started with today's content, let's review the logistics. This series includes three one and a half hour sessions and the uh, remaining session after today will be held on August 19th at the same time, 12 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Recordings of each session of this series can be found on the training webpage. We've provided a link to the webpage here and we'll have a question and answer session at the end of each part. So um, please do enter your questions along the way and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. If we're not able to get to your questions or if you have any questions after the session is over, feel free to email myself or my colleagues. Our email addresses are shown here. And we've also provided an email address for the Wallace team in the installation instructions on the website. So you can email them with specifics about um, today's session overview of the three sessions for this training series. Today we will focus on a tool for modeling species niches and distributions called Wallace. And during the final session we will discuss additional species distribution modeling projects and tools. So now I'd like to hand over the presentation to our Wallace guest speakers. First we have Erica Johnson, a PhD candidate from City University of New York. She has participated in many research projects, both academic and nonprofit settings, and she seeks to integrate fieldwork with landscape ecology. Currently, she's interested in the biogeography of diseases under global change. Her PhD research focuses on applying SDMs to understand how landscape may influence biotic interactions among parasites and hosts and their potential implications for human health. Second, we have Andrea Pazvelez, who is a postdoctoral researcher with ETH Zurich. She is interested in incorporating remote sensing into biodiversity research to improve our understanding of the relation between environments and biodiversity, aiming to improve biodiversity monitoring. As part of the Wallace team, Andrea contributed to general software development and spearheaded the integration of tools for conservation applications in Wallace that will be presented today. And finally, Mary Blair, the Director for Biodiversity Informatics at the American Museum of Natural History, will be joining us online during the question and answer portion. She is a conservation biologist with more than 15 years of field research experience in Latin America and Asia, studying the evolutionary drivers of biodiversity to inform the spatial prioritization of conservation actions. She is leading the NASA-funded expansion of Wallace to facilitate biodiversity assessment and reporting by conservation practitioners. She was also a co-author on the re recent open source release of Maxent, the most commonly used software algorithm for SDM. So now over to you, Wallace team. Yeah, thank you for that introduction and thank you all for coming. So we'll be talking about how to use Wallace to model species niches and distributions. And just to give a little overview about this session, I'm going to start talking about how to use Wallace for species distribution modeling. Then my partner Andrea is going to walk you through how to run a species distribution model from beginning to end in Wallace. Then we'll be talking a little bit about the redesign and expansion that went into V2, which is coming out really soon, which makes it easier to visualize results and we added some new cool models. Um, and finally, to wrap things all up, we're going to talk about the things we're working on V3 to post-process SDMs for conservation decision making. So let's start off with species distribution models in Wallace. And just before I jump into Wallace, I want to have a brief recap on what SDMs are and how they work. So if you remember from our last session, one of the things that SDMs try to do is characterize a species niche in terms of the environmental variables that are necessary for its survival and persistence in a region in environmental space. So we take, for example, precipitation and temperature and find this combination 
and then transfer that into geographic space to find the areas where these environments exist and therefore where our species could persist. And one of the things I want to know is that just because things are very close in environmental space, so if we notice the little purple and green dots, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily in close proximity when we transfer this into geography. So the way that species distribution models do this is typically by taking species occurrences and then predictor variables, which we consider are important for the species ecology. So this could be climate or land cover, topography, anything we can think of. And we put these uh, variables into a model, which can be regression-based or machine learning. As we've mentioned throughout the sessions, there are many ways in which we can build a species distribution model. And then through this model, we try to predict the geographic areas in which the species could be and generate a potential distribution map. So there were two typical ways until recently in which we could approach species distribution modeling. The first one was using um, softwares that had graphic user interfaces or GUIs that were really friendly and easy to use. However, these tended to be very inflexible in terms of the, the variety of tools that we could use and were typically not updated very frequently, which um, you know, made it difficult to keep up to date with the cutting edge you know, techniques that were being developed and also led to many users using them inappropriately. Another way you could go about it was learning how to code. And as all of us who have learned how to code at any point know, it's, it's very flexible, but have, you know, the, the problem with it is that it's very prone to errors and there's a very steep learning curve. There was definitely a need to, for, for a software in the species distribution modeling community uh, that achieves a balance between automation and supervision, and specifically a software that is capable of automating repetitive tasks, forcing users to make critical biological and conceptual decisions and a software that's general enough with the, you know, with respect to all the algorithms that could be used in order to fit the user's needs. This inspired our team and very specifically this fellow over here, Jamie Cass, to come up with Wallace. This is an R Shiny app, which means that it has a graphic user interface that is very friendly and runs R in the background. And what is Wallace anyway? So a, a very simple way of thinking about Wallace is that it's a user-friendly application for species distribution modeling that provides guidance towards following best practices at each step. One of the things about Wallace is that it, it has a variety of features that make it very user-friendly. For example, it's accessible, instructive, flexible, interactive, reproducible, expandable, and open. And I know this is a mouthful and I'll go on to explain each one step by step. So Wallace is accessible because it lowers a barrier to implement these cutting edge SDM techniques through our very friendly graphic user interface. It also allows users to download occurrence and environmental data from a diversity of sources. Also users can find support from the community through various networks including Google Groups and GitHub. While this is instructive, it provides educational and instructional resources addressing con concepts and theories related to species distribution modeling, as well as the methods that you could follow to build your models. Additionally, it, it guides the users in following these best practice practices at each step of the process. While it's flexible, it allows users to select from a multitude of data sources and analytical tools which as we've been saying are many and there's no correct one and it all depends on what the user's needs are and what the study calls for. While this is interactive, it provides an assortment of dynamic visualizations such as maps, tables, and graphs that allows users to explore their data and the results. It's also reproducible. This is, I find to be one of the most exciting parts of Wallace. As I mentioned, R is running in the background and the code is being saved as you run it through the GUI. So at the end, you're able to download this code, which is executable and allows you to replicate the analyses. It also allows you to save your work and load it later so you don't have to redo any steps. Wallace is expandable. So the way that Wallace is built is modular, meaning that it has these components, which are the columns or row A, which represent the larger steps in the modeling process. And within each component, we have modules, which um, you can think about them as different options that you have to run within these steps. So different analytical tools. And because 
Wallace is built this way in a modular way, it means that we can add components or modules and make the software grow. And lastly, Wallace is open. This means that the code is publicly available for all users to download on CRAN and GitHub, and users are also able to modify and suggest enhancements to the code, enabling users to eventually become contributors as well. So I hope that gave you an overall idea of what Wallace is and how it works. And with that, I'm gonna hand this off to Andrea, who's gonna run a live demo of version one of Wallace. Hi, I'm Andrea, and I'm gonna be uh, walking you through a full workflow um, to build an SVM in Wallace. And just remember that all the instructions to install Wallace are available on the website and that you will be um, getting a recording from this walkthrough um, in 48 hours, so you can follow along uh, when you install the software. We are also providing some extra slides at the end um, that will be available on the website that will have a screenshot of every part of this uh, walkthrough, if it makes it easier. So like Erica just showed you, to start Wallace, you have to run two commands in R, just this two, which are library, Wallace, and then run Wallace. And this will open a window on your default um, Internet Explorer. So in my case, it's Safari, but it could be Google Chrome, Mozilla. It will open in the one that you have set as default. And this is Wallace. It will always open with a description of the software that you can look up. It basically summarizes what Erica just talked about. And it has all the components with numbers from one to eight, and we will go through them one by one. First, to run an SDM, you need to get occurrence data for your species. And in this case, I'm gonna show you a demo with an amphibian, a frog that is endemic to the Northern Andes. Uh, it's called Anthropsophus molitor. And you need to make sure that it's spelled right so that we can look it up, in this case, in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. But do remember, you can also upload your own data points and set the maximum number of occurrences. I just want all of them and then query the database. As you can see in the lower right, um, there's a bar showing you the progress and these are all the points available for these species. It will always show up on the map and then first thing you do every time is look at the occurrences and evaluate whether they are in the right geographical area. If they're not, you can go to the second component, the process occurrences, and select the area that you know the species is present in. So in this case, I know that this area should be removed. It's just uh, a very similar species, so you can draw a polygon around the points that you want to keep. Say it's this. And double click for the polygon to be created and then select the occurrences. As you can see, the occurrences that were outside of the boundary were removed and then you can remove the polygon. You can also see that those points are very close together and Erica talked a little bit about um, sampling bias and you heard about it yesterday. So we're gonna do a spatial thinning of the data set to 10 kilometers, which will just remove the points that are too close together. As you can see in red, you have the points that we are keeping and in blue, the points that will be not deleted and not into the model. Third, we're gonna get the environmental data. And in this case, we're gonna use the World Clean BioClims you can select the resolution going from the, the bigger pixels to the smaller pixels. We're going to do an intermediate model today and just load all environmental data. And then it 
whenever this shows up, you're ready, you have your data in your computer, it's a raster stack of all the layers. Again, you can always input your own layers, which can be derived from remote sensing. In this case, we're using um, a pre-available uh, data set, the WorldClim data set. Then we can process the environmental data. And for this, we need to just decide what's the region where we're gonna build our model. We're gonna do a very simple selection today, a minimum convex polygon up around our points, our observed points, with a small buffer. And we just select, that's the area for our model. And then we want to sample the background. Um, of the area where the species is present to be able to build a model. And we wanna do a good sampling, but this is a very small area. So I'm just gonna reduce this to a thousand points. You wanna have a sampling of all the area. Then sample, I'm gonna go up so you can see. Um, you get all the information in this log box. Uh, random background points were sampled. So you're ready to go to, to the next component. The next component is called partition occurrences. And in this case, you wanna partition your occurrences into training and testing data sets so you can have testing statistics for your model. Wallace offers two options. You can either do non-spatial partition, random partitions, or spatial partitions structured in space. For the non-spatial partition, you can either do a jackknife, which is um, all points are included in the partition or a random k-fold in which you select the number of groups that you want to partition into. For the spatial partition, you have op three options to do this in a block, as a checkerboard, um, and with different numbers of groups. We're going to do a non-spatial partition today, a random fold of two that this runs quicker. The more partitions you have, this will take a little longer in your computer. I'm gonna partition and each color corresponds to one partition. So as you can see, this one was random and we have partition number one in red and partition number two in blue. We go into the next component, uh, the model part. As of right now, Wallace is offering two options, two algorithms, the BioClaim algorithm and the Maxent algorithm. Um, today we're gonna use Maxent. Um, again, it's offering two options for Maxent, either the Maxnet package for R or the Maxent Java um, software. Just if you're gonna use the Java version, you will have to have it installed in your computer before you run Wallace. Uh, so today we're gonna use the MaxNet component. You have to select the feature classes, the kind of response that you think um, makes sense for your species, either a linear response of the presence of the suitability uh, with each environmental variable. It can be a linear quadratic, it can have hinge features, and it can have product features. We're gonna run a very simple model today, just with the first two. And you also have to select a penalty against complexity in the case of MaxNet, which you can move in this little bar. Today, again, we're just gonna do something small. The multiplier step is just telling you how this complexity is gonna be tested. So either every step or every half step or every two steps, we're gonna do every half step today. And then you can run. So whenever you run a model in Wallace, you will first get this table with statistics. And this is showing you for every row, one of the models that was run with one of the combinations that was selected. So remember we selected different feature classes and different penal penalties for um, complexity. So all the possible combinations and you have several statistics to choose from uh, to select the best model that you want to use. Today we will be using a sequential criteria uh, with two statistics, the area under the curve and the emission rates in the model. 
And so what we are looking for is the lowest emission rate. So the emissions rates are coded as OR for emission rate, the lowest uh, emission rate here, and you can organize the table. And then within those that have the same emission rate, we're looking for the best area under the curve. And so that will be here. So the best one in this case would be the first one, which is a model that only had linear feature classes and a penalty of one. And then you can select that model in this log box. And it's very important that you select the right model before you go onto the visualization component where you will be looking at the statistics here, but also you can map the prediction. You can map the model. You can select, we're gonna select the clock log prediction right now and no threshold. And so you can see your continuous model of habitat suitability for this amphibian. You can also decide that you want a binary map one for presence, zero for absence. And Wallace right now offers options for two thresholds, either the minimum training presence or the 10 percentile training presence we're gonna use today. So you can plot the binary map and here blue would be presence and gray would be absence. And the last component allows you to make projections in time and space. And so this model that was calibrated for the area of presence of the species can be projected to the future to see how climate change is gonna impact the distribution, or it can be projected in space, for example, to uh, sort of evaluate the invasive invasion potential of a species. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to do a new time. So you select new time here as a module. You select the time period that you wanna project to. So let's say 2070. And then you have to select the global circulation model, um, carbon emission model, let's say it's gonna be the most dramatic. And again, you have to decide if this projection will be binary or not. Let's try a binary projection. And you have to select the area where it will be projected. So in this case, I want to project to sort of the same area just to see how climate change is going to change the distribution in this area. And so we project. And now we can clear the polygon and you can see how the projection shows a different distribution um, in the future. Finally, the last step, the one that doesn't have a number, that is called session code. That's where you can download your code. And Erica talked about this when she was describing the software. So you get an RMD, which you can download. And I will show you the result. You can open this in a text editor. There you go. This will have all the history of the decisions that you made while running your Wallace model. And it will be ready to run again from R. And for you to make any code modifications that you wanna make within R, and this is an RMD that is very documented. So you have every step here. This is our first component, obtain occurrence data. and what the species that we looked for, the database that we use, the limit that we use, and this will be repeated for every component and every decision that you made. So you can replicate your analysis and especially you can make um, modifications. Going back to Wallace for a moment, I just wanted to show you that if you have any questions about any of the components that we talked about or any of the modules that we talked about, in every component, you have the tabs here that include the component guidance. And we talked about um, what the component is doing, uh, which we just described. And then you have the module guidance. So depending on the module that you choose, you'll get information on how the module works uh, and especially the references. And it will point you to the literature to make the best possible decision in each module. 
and it will change if you change the module that you are selecting you have a new so this is for the new extent and this will be for the new time and this is available in all your components so do take a look at the guidance okay so one more thing in all the components where there's a visualization available there's also the possibility to download what you're visualizing so in this case i was looking at the projection the time projection you would be able to download either the picture so a png or a raster file geotiff and ascii uh, or grd that you can then open in another um, geographic information system we're now going to go back to the presentation where i'm going to show you a little bit of the new um, components and modules that will be soon available in Wallace and for which if you want to um, install you can email us and we'll send you instructions for development versions and thank you for watching the demo I'm now going to go back to the presentation so Wallace has been in constant development and expansion and the newest version version 2 will be released very soon and this version is making it easier to add new modules in particular uh, so for collaborators or anyone interested to add their packages as part of Wallace it is also allowing to access many more data sources so today I showed you three databases that you could use uh, for uh, species distribution points and one database that you could use for uh, climate data. This has been expanded in the new Wallace version. Uh, it also allows for multiple species to be worked on at the same time. So you can create multiple models at the same time and you can compare those species. It is based on the RMMS metadata uh, workflow, so it is easier to document your model for a publication. And this development has been heavily guided by user feedback that we get from conference workshops, emails, the Google group that we still have and we invite you to join. And we have now been working on what will be version three, uh, which is focusing on post processing for conservation. And this has been funded by NASA and has been produced in collaboration with the Humboldt Institute in Colombia and in particular their Biomodelos group. And it has been thought as a bond in a box, so a biodiversity observation network analysis tool. What we have been doing is adding a few new components. So you recognize this from what Erica was showing you, except now we have a new component to process with remote sensing data and a new component to calculate indicators. And those two are based on two packages that the team has been developing that are called Mask Ranger and Change Ranger. And those two packages were first developed as independent R packages and then integrated into Wallace. The first one is Mask Ranger and Mask Ranger um, has been created to do post-processing of SDMs. In particular, it allows to use the use of remote sensing products like forest cover, cultivars, urbanization, protected areas to both crop your models, uh, but also to understand what percentage um, is in a certain protected area or in a certain land cover. And it also allows experts to correct the maps if they know that the species is present in another area or is not present in one of the areas that is being modeled. And I'm just gonna show you a quick example of how this works. Uh, this is the Olinguito. This is a recently described small carnivore that is limited to high altitude cloud forest in Northern South America. It's very data poor and it needs an IUCN status update given recent deforestation and the first model that was produced didn't reflect the exact distribution of this little mammal. So this is an SDM where you can see areas in red are higher suitability and areas in blue are lower suitability. And so what the team did for this study was 
get all the recent occurrences for the Olinguito and match them to the Moody's yearly forest cover data so that we would know what's the minimum forest that this species needs to be present. And when you do that in Mass Ranger and create a new distribution, you can see that only the areas in um, color are the areas that are really suitable for the Olinguito. And the areas in black were climatically suitable, but don't have the necessary forest. And, and this is very important for conservation uh, purposes. We've also been working on calculating indicators. And for that, uh, the team has created the Change Ranger, the Change Ranger package, which allows for calculating key biodiversity change indicators that are important, for example, for IUCN assessments. And that includes the computing of the area of occupancy, AOO, the extent of occurrence, the EOO, the percentage of suitable land cover, the representativeness of the species distribution in protected areas, so how much of the species um, range is protected, for example. It, it also allows for showing the changes in range over time and space. And so the graph that you're seeing here in the right is showing how the Olinguito distribution is changing in time with the forestation. And so even though it had 42,000 km square kilometers of distribution in 2005, according to the deforestation data that we got from the MODIS sensors, uh, this has gone as low as 30,000 square kilometers in 2009 and 10. So you can see how your distribution would change given remote sensing products. Finally, with trying to integrate how to calculate multi-species indicators. And so at this point, Wallace can compute measures of species richness and species endemism. And so the maps that you're seeing are richness and endemism for primates in Colombia. And very soon we will be integrating other measures like phylogenetic diversity, phylogenetic endemism, complementarity, uh, to think about conservation in a multi-species level. So just to summarize, uh, Wells is an user-friendly application for species distribution modeling, and it provides guidance towards following best practices at each step. And I hope that the demo showed you how accessible, instructable, flexible, interactive, and reproducible and oh, expandable Wallace was. Um, we have two versions coming soon, uh, V2 before V3. Uh, V2 will provide additional SDM data sources and it will allow for multiple species distribution models to be run, run at the same time. And it also facilitates module contributions from, user from the user community. Wallace V3, on the other hand, is adding tools for conservation applications. Yes, it allows for um, the calculation of biodiversity indicators, but also to, it allows for improvement of the species ranges estimates uh, by using both remote sensing data and user information. And those two versions are now uh, available for beta, for beta testing. And if you're interested, uh, please contact us. Uh, the information is available in the installation instructions, and we will get back to you with precise installation instructions for both development versions. Thank you very much, and I'm handing it over to Amber now. Thank you, Erica and Andrea, for the great presentation and demonstration of Wallace. Uh, really exciting stuff. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone that next session, we are gonna highlight some additional um, SDM tools and techniques. So do please join us for our, our next and final part of the series. And I also wanted to remind everyone um, that we're going to now move into the question and answer session, but feel free to email myself or my colleagues at our email addresses listed here. You can find all the course materials, including the presentations, the uh, links to view the recordings, as well as the um, instructions for the installation and running of Wallace um, at the training webpage. So do please check that out. Um, 
also next session we will have the link to the homework provided on the the website there as well um, and of course you can visit the rset website for um, any other trainings um, that we have across a variety of application areas so um, there's a lot to find on the rset website shown here you can also follow us on twitter um, and our twitter handle is shown there so once again um, a, a real big thank you to our guest speakers we so appreciate your time and being here and um, really getting um, the tool out to the community and and thank you all for joining us today um, we have also listed the um, Wallace GitHub page, as well as the Google group for Wallace. So if you are interested in um, integrating this into your workflow and, and using Wallace, um, please do join the Google group. Um, there's a lot of nice um, Q&A there as well and, and helpful support for, for running um, the model. So thank you again, and we will now move into the question and answer session. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so if you would just give us a moment, we're gonna um, move on over to the question and answer document. Um, I wanna thank all of you for being here. We have over 1200 participants from around the world. So we're so glad um, that we're getting such a, from our community here. I wanna mention a few things before we jump into the questions. Um, we will have one homework available and that will be on the website next session. So check back for that on Thursday, the 19th, when we have our final session. And that um, is a Google form that you can complete within two weeks in order to receive your certificate of completion. And it does take quite a while for us to get all the certificates out to the community. So do please allow about three months to receive that. I also wanted to mention that we have included the information about the Wallace Google group and um, an email address that you can use for any questions that specifically pertain to Wallace on our question and answer document. And we will go through as many uh, questions as we can during the time today. Um, and then we will also be posting this document to the training website so you can refer back to it at a later date um, to get any of the specifics on um, those questions. And if you don't get your question answered today, you can always email um, the RSET team or the Wallace team at their um, Gmail address shown there. Um, great, well, I will go ahead and jump right in and we'll get into some of these questions here. So the first question, asks, would any of the resource persons be familiar with predictor variable data sets on global average emergent tree height? I'm asking as emergent trees are a known limiting factor for my species of interest, a tropical forest raptor that depends on emergent trees for nesting. I'm currently using average canopy height as a proxy for emergent tree height. Looks like Mary might, um, be able to address that question? Hi, yes, hello everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Um, thanks for this question. So I'm, I'm not aware of any global uh, data sets available. Um, it would be good to check around for local data sets um, in your area of interest. But I do know that NASA's JEDI mission and the JEDI science team are coming up with some pretty cool algorithms and models for global data sets of other kind of forest structure related variables that when combined with canopy height might be a little bit more informative for, for your work. So stay tuned to that mission. And I know there are some things coming out soon. And uh, the Geobond Ecosystem Structure Working Group also has some interesting ideas of new variables that they'll be delivering through the, the Geobond uh, database. Great, thank you, Mary. And I will note that, um, well, it doesn't specifically address your question of emergent trees. That's a sort of a very difficult um, estimation to get at, as you may have noticed. Um, we have had some trainings on SAR data. We have actually have a, quite a few trainings on SAR data in general on the RSET website. And recently we um, had one focused on you, the use of SAR data for forest mapping. So that might be something um, of use 
for you as well. And we've included the um, training website there as well. So do please take a look at that. Okay, great. Thank you, Mary. Moving on to question two. What, what can the maximum number of occurrences be for Wallace? I have data from 6,000 to 60,000 and use greater than 10 environmental biological indicators through BioOracle. Yes, I believe I entered this one. So it seems like you're very lucky and you have a lot of occurrence data, which most of us do not have, you know, we're not fortunate enough to have this sort of data. Um, so I don't think there's actually a limit on the number of occurrences that you can input into Wallace, but your computer might not be super happy with that amount of occurrence data. Um, so the limiting factor might be the computational power of your computer and the memory. So one of the main issues with R is that it does allocate um, memory on your RAM. And if that burns out, it might crash. Um, uh, one of the things that I do think, however, is that you might be concerned a little bit just by by the amount of data that you have about spatial biases resulting from the sampling design. And that is definitely something you would want to look into reducing in order to make a good quote unquote model. Uh, and fortunately, Wallace allows you to do this within the SP thin or spatial thin module in the process ox component. And I, I hope that answered your question. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on to question three. To what spatial scale is recommended to use R. Wallace? Yes, I think that, that was me. Um, the spatial scale really is not about the software, but more about your question and the scale that you have um, variables available to use. So, What's programmed within Wallace right now is that you can access the WorkClean database, and WorkClean database has data at 30 arcsec, 2.5 arcmin, 5 arcmin, or 10 arcmin. But you can upload any data into Wallace as user specified, and so you can upload variables at any resolution, just as long as all of your variables are at the same resolution. So you can do 30 meters if you want, but everything has to be at 30 meters. Um, Great, thank you. That's a great point. And we talked a little bit during session one about um, having all of your data layers at the same spatial scale. That's um, usually pretty important when conducting this type of modeling, um, either conducting upscaling or downscaling to match those layers is really important. So thank you. Okay, question four. Wallace V2 will be released soon. When is the exact date? I guess I can do this too. Um, we don't have an exact date uh, because we are partly subject to um, the peer review process for the manuscript that is associated to Wallace V2, but it should be officially released this fall. Um, in the meantime, if you're interested in either V2 or V3, there are beta ver versions available and you can contact the team for installation instructions and beta testing instructions. Great, thank you. Okay, question five. Can you use remote sensing variables like leaf area index and NDVI variables in SDM? Yeah, this was me, this is Mary. The answer is yes, absolutely. Um, but it's important, with especially with remote sensing variables, to make sure that the occurrence data that you're using as input and the remote sensing variables match up in terms of temporal scale uh, for training the model. And as long as the variables that you're using are the same extent and resolution, you can use them together. Yeah, great point. And we 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 did talk about leaf area index and NDVI in session one, as well as um, those in environmental sort of predictor variables. Um, very important. NDVI is a is a huge one I see being used quite often, um, in particular if you have a species that. Um, is is moving across the landscape and maybe moving according to vegetation health or um, phenology uh, changes. So, yeah, that's a great point. Those are oftentimes very useful variables to include. Okay, question six. How would you select a proper thinning distance 
why should the occurrence data be spatially thinned? Yeah, so this is also me. Um, so ideally, to select the proper thinning distance, you would have some information about the biology of the species, such as their home range, daily travel distance, um, or maybe for, you know, for plants like dispersal distance, um, or about the sampling density for that group to help inform your selection. Because what you're trying to do is balance so that you have enough data to characterize the full environmental space that the species occupies, but also to avoid spatial bias and autocorrelation. Because if, if your input data are biased, um, they're just reflecting where people went to sample your species instead of where they actually are in a biological sense. Um, so really this, the selecting a proper thinning distance is about making sure that you're modeling what you want to model and not just where people sampled for, for your species of interest. Great, great point. Thank you. Okay, question seven. Is there a way to check on the multicollinearity between the downscaled bioclimb variables in Wallace? Um, I think, Andrea, we can tag team this one, or if you want, I can just take it. That's what I was going to say. We could do this together. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, we don't have a formal multicollinearity test, but in V2, you can look at a PCA in the environmental space component um, for all of your variables. However, when you're running MaxNet or MaxNet, you can penalize complexity by increasing the regularization multiplier value, and you saw that very quickly in the demo. And this will, in practice, penalize the use of collinear variables. And then Mary can explain further here. Yeah, so this it gets a little technical here, and some in this field, people feel some people feel very strongly about collinearity, but from a super technical perspective. Um, with Maxent anyway, which is a machine learning algorithm, it determines predictor variable importance in the context of the other variables using internal variable selection, using regularization, which Andrea just talked about. And this algorithm, it discards redundant information and it only gains novel information even when the novel information is really, really tiny. And so if you remove highly correlated variables from the analysis, you could be removing a small amount of data that might be important. Um, so, you know, but there are other SDM algorithms where you, it is important to control for collinearity. So it's key to really um, be aware of all of this. And Wallace includes component and module guidance and the full references for some of these concepts so that, you know, you can really um, educate yourself and learn a bit more about um, all of these issues. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on to question eight. Thank you. If you use your own data, what sort of format format does it need to be? And how do you upload this into Wallace? Okay, um, so as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, when I had that flow chart, there are mainly two types of data you need to build an SDM. The first is occurrence data, and then we have predictor variables or predictor data. So our occurrence data needs to be provided as a CSV table, and it has to have at least three columns. So the scientific name of your species, longitude, and latitude. And one of the things that is very important to know is that your, your table, your CSV file, has to have those exact names in the columns. That means um, no capital letters, just exactly as they are right there, and in that order or else Wallace will not read them. Now, the predictor variables, which are typically environmental data, must be provided in raster format. Um, and Wallace does allow for several raster formats to be uploaded, so it doesn't have to necessarily be TIFFs or, or GRD, which is the R format. Um, it, it does allow for some flexibility there. Uh, for both types of data in the pertinent component, so we have OCK data for occurrence data, and then ENV data for environmental data. Both of them have a module called user specified. When you click on that on the radio dial, you automatically get a little button that says browse and you're able to upload your data as you normally would. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on to question nine. 
This is a question about the modular approach of Wallace. Does Wallace simply import the functions from other packages, for example, Dismo, or does it port to the functions from the source code? Yeah, I believe I answered this. Um, Wallace imports functions. It doesn't import them, although for some packages, uh, we have what we call wrapper functions that prepare the data that is needed for those packages to work and produces the warning and error messages that you see in the log window in Wallace. And within each component and within each module, you can see in the lower left of your screen, a list of the used packages uh, with their links to their references, the relevant references. And in V2, this will also be provided as part of the RMB file, just a list of all of the packages that were called for your analysis. Great, thank you. Okay, question 10. What is the basis for partitioning occurrence data? What does partition do with the occurrences? And what are the what is the basis for choosing different methods for partitioning? Okay, so the basis of partitioning your occurrence data is that when we build a model, we normally split the data into two main groups. So we have our calibration group, which is the data that we're using to actually build the model. And then we have our evaluation group. So normally the, the data is built on the calibration group, and then we try to assess how well it predicts the data that was withheld in the evaluation group. Um, the partitioning method that is going to be used really depends on your data. So for example, if you have very few points, you might want to use a jackknifing approach, which just means that um, you take one point out at a time and use the rest of your points to predict that single point, which is really good when you have very scarce occurrence data. But if your goal of the study, for example, is um, it might also depend on the goal of the study. So, for example, if your goal is to, to project it into a different time period with different climates, you might want to use a spatial block partition because this allows to test how well your model transfers into a, a potentially different environment. So this is there's a whole literature on this, and you can find some of it in the Muscarella paper that I referenced there. Um, and you can also find it in, in Wallace's guidance text. We have a list of, of references that you can refer to to understand this more. And additionally, if you want to understand it a little bit more, I know I added a slide at the very end. We have some additional like supplemental slides, and there's one specifically about partitioning that has a very nice visual that might help you understand this. Great, thank you. And we've included the um, PDF of the presentation slides in the handouts portion of the um, GoToWebinar software as well. So you can access that there. Sounds like there are a lot of resources. <laughs> okay, question 11. For the users that are somewhat new to SDM, does the Wallace documentation provide either guidance or literature references to all of the steps and decisions so that users can make a more informed uh, prioritization decision. Yes, it's me again. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one of our main goals is to be for Wallace to be instructive. So there's information at every single step and every single component um, about the component in general, which is the major modeling step. But as well, there's information on the actual different tools or the modules that are inside our component. And if you see the, I call it the results panel where the map is, there's different little tabs on top with orange letters. There's one called component guidance and one that's called module guidance. And these are refer either to the general step or to the specific tool that you have selected. Um, it, it provides, as, as the word says, you know, guidance uh, related to these topics, but it also provides references directly related to these topics. So I would suggest um, anybody who wants to learn a lot more and dig in to reference those tabs and, and check them out. Great, yeah, lots here. Okay, question 12. Querying GBIF using Wallace is not working. The progress bar is stuck at one eighth of the bar. Is this a bug? Hi, I can take this. This is Mary. So when this question came in, I quickly tried it myself and it worked just fine for me. Um, so I think there are a couple things to double check here. Of course, it could be a connection issue. So if you have a low connection and the 
larger number of records you're searching for, the slower it's going to be while also screaming a webinar. So that could be it. Um, but also just make sure you have the correct scientific name. Uh, double check that GBIF actually has that species by going directly to their website because we're using the, the GBIF API here to um, bring the GBIF data into Wallace. Um, and also double check that the set maximum value of occurrences is not zero or not like a super high number, which could take a while too. So you could sort of test if it's working by setting a maximum value of like 100 or something lower than that and just make sure it's working uh, and then try a higher number. Great, thank you. And I'm just adding the GBIF website here for more information. Um, we talked about this during session one as well. Okay, question 13. After downloading the Wallace code, is it possible to rerun that code in Wallace, or would you need to open the code in a text editor and use it to re-enter your model in Wallace? Yes, so we have two things uh, in this question. The code itself, the one that you download um, as an RMD, the one that I showed at the end of the demo, that one you can rerun in R, but not in Wallace. So it's just an R code. However, Starting with V2, you will be able to save and load your Wallace session as an RDS file. And so you can save at any point in your analysis and then load again within Wallace. So that is coming in the next version. Great, thank you. Okay, question 14. Can this model be used for plant species such as mangroves? in ma modeling mangrove distribution and relating it to sea level rise, but historical sea level rise data is limited. Are there available proxy data? Should I follow the resolution of the mangroves? Lots of questions baked into this one. Yeah, I, I can take this. I think more was added to this question than when I first answered it. But in terms of using for plant species, um, absolutely, uh, theoretically, um, these models work even better for plants uh, than some like really large bodied vertebrates, for example, that are more generalists. Um, however, if you want to model a mangrove um, or like, you know, a, a system or a community, you can also do that. Um, and Andrea can talk about that a little bit too, but there's some trickiness to it. Um, I need to know more about the specific area about proxy data for mangroves, but you know there are WorldClim does have in their past projections um, for like mid Holocene and going back farther. It, it does incorporate sea level rise, um, and I don't understand uh, what is meant by resolution of the mangroves. So I think. Uh, you can just email us some more of these questions and perhaps clarify further and we can we can help you out. Great, thank you. Um, I've also added a link to a um, recent training that we did um, for mangroves, for mapping mangroves and um, related to UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so I've included the link there. Um, that training, uh, focused on the use of Google Earth Engine to do things like um, mapping mangrove extent, looking at time series analysis of mangroves, um, calculating the area of mangroves. So this might be something that uh, would help you in your work as well. Um, so do take a look at that. Okay, question 15. Does Wallace have projection features for marine environments or is it just terrestrial? Can Wallace be used to model the distribution of marine species? Are there data sets related to ocean bathymetry? And um, most of the ocean data sets seem to be sea surface temperature. Yeah, this is Mary again. Um, there are bathymetry data sets out there. I can't think of them off the top of my head, but we can include them uh, later um, in this document when it's sent out. Um, and right now, Wallace doesn't include those data sets, you know, um, in Wallace itself, but um, users can include 
any data that they want. Um, so you, you would just find them and then uploaded them as um, user-specified variables for your area of interest. Great, thank you. And we will be talking a little bit about marine environments um, and fisheries in particular um, in the final session. So check back for that. It may or may not be related to uh, your questions here. Okay, question 16. How can we export the final SDM map to any other software such as ARC for classifying the area of more suitable and less or moderately suitable habitat? Yes, this is Andrea. Um, okay, I think I need to add some things there. Um, you can definitely download your model. So I showed you that there's a tab um, that is called download in every module. So if you go to the visualization part and to the download tab, you can uh, get rasters of your model. There are several formats available, including GeoTIFF, ASCII, and GRED grids. Um, you can also get the map itself as a PNG. Um, but for classifying, as I just saw this part, within Wallace, you can also apply thresholds. There are some pre-programmed uh, thresholds available, including the minimum presence threshold and the 10 percentile tra training presence threshold, um, which you can apply within Wallace. And again, download the raster of the binary map. Both are available. Great, a lot of options then. Okay, question 17. Could you please repeat what statistics in Wallace are useful to test the model quality? Yes, that's this is me, Mary. So um, highly encourage you to read carefully the component and module guidance uh, that we have for users in Wallace that gives some detailed information and, and further references to look into to try and make these decisions um, because you know, in a certain sense, the statistics you use really depend on the species you're modeling and if it's a small sample size or a really big sample size and and how much uh, complexity um, you're willing to allow um, in, in your model. But a general rule of thumb uh, is to select the optimal model based on performance metrics that balance predictive ability, model sensitivity, and specificity. So typically I advise, you know, like my students to take a look at the average test omission error and the average test area under the receiver operating characteristic curve or AUC. And then with smaller sample sizes, and especially if you're concerned about your model being overfit, over parameterized, overly complex, uh, which is for, you know, especially concerned if, for example, you want to project your model under future climate change or under a novel environment, you don't want it to be so fit, overfit to, to your data that it, it can't really inform those projections. Then you should also look at the lowest Delta AIC score and maybe even look at that first. Um, and also look at the number of parameters included in the final model. And all of these you can view on the table in the results tab of Wallace. Great, thank you. Really informative, detailed answer there to that question. Um, okay, question 18. Can you model more than one species at any given time? Yes, uh, I'll take this one. So currently in V1, it is not possible, but as we mentioned, uh, V2 does allow for multi-species modeling, so this will be out very soon. Great, thank you. Question 19, as a student, can I publish a paper about using Wallace's data for any desired area? If yes, is there specific guidance on how to do so? Um, I'll, I'll did this one, this is Mary. So we, um, we do have a suggested citation on our website. Um, if you use Wallace for your research workflow. So we ask that you cite the the original paper that published Wallace um, and that citation is here. However, the data sets that 
you use um, or that we serve in Wallace are actually coming from other places. So, and we do include the references for those data sets. So please make sure to also cite whichever data sets you end up using. That's a great point. Yeah, um, we've talked about a lot of uh, um, portals for data and we'll, we'll even discuss some more next, next session, but it's always a great practice to follow the trail back to where you're receiving all of your data and properly cite those things. Um, great. Okay. For a moment, I should be back on my audio now. Um, so question 20, uh, how, do, how does modeling with Wallace on aquatic species that are limited areas such as rivers, lakes, or swap, swamps, and how do you do modeling on migratory species that are sensitive with um, barriers like like a dam in their migratory route. Yeah, I'll take this one as well. This is Mary. This is um, a great question, something we've been thinking about a lot with um, our users that are interested in, especially freshwater species. Um, and we've been thinking about this for V3, especially for conservation folks. So, you know, the a typical way to do it is to find a shape file for the stream of interest, and you can basically either clip your environmental variables just to that area um, or run the model and then clip the model, the resulting model um, to that area. So there are different ways to do it and we're, we're kind of experimenting with those through some use cases, um, but this will be something you can definitely do a little bit in, in version three. Um, and it's really important to, to think about this and not only for freshwater species, but like, a lot of the things that you model um, over predict into areas where they're not found, like maybe the other side of a mountain range that they can't reach or the other side of a river. Um, and so, um, yeah, some of the things you'll be able to do in version three will let you basically like clip out that part that doesn't make sense for, for that species. Great question. Great, thanks. Okay. Moving on to question 21. At step four, the process environment, I cannot find a way to select the study region. When I try to sample the background, I keep getting error um, before sampling background points to find the background extent. Can you clarify this step? Yes. Of course. So component number four, the processing of the environmental variables actually has two steps and you must do both steps for it to work. So the first step is selecting the background extent. So just like what's the shape of your background? And you can either use a predetermined extent as I showed in the demo, which is a minimum convex polygon or a point buffer or just a bounding box um, around your points. You can do a user provided extent. That means you upload a shape file with your extent or you can draw your extent and extent of interest. After you create the extent, then you can sample the background points because the background points are only sampled within the extent, so it must be defined first. That's why you're getting the error. It's just a step right before it. Great, thank you. Okay, question 22. In Wallace, can you make a principal component analysis graphs? I think, Ooh, I think, yeah, you go ahead. I think I answered it, but it's really your answer. <laughs> <laughs> I can take it, yes. Uh, in version two, we will, well, we do have a PCA option within the environmental space component. So it allows for comparing the environmental spaces of different species with a PCA, with also density grids. And finally, it performs niche overlap um, analysis in environmental space. In version two, it will only be available to compare two or more species. You cannot do it for a single species. Great. Question 23, are there specific Wallace workshops that we could participate in? Um, 
Yes, this is Mary again. So we, we have one uh, coming up soon in October for the Student Conference on Conservation Science New York, which will be virtual. Um, well, there'll be in-person events on the last day, but our particular Wallace workshop will be virtual. Um, and we often have workshops at other international conferences like the International Biogeography Society and many others. Um, and Erica and, and Andrea both here have led workshops in a lot of a variety of venues and also in Spanish, so also in multiple languages. We also have a lot of webinars um, that you can find on our website that will help you as well. But if you're interested and you can't think of how to access any of uh, these upcoming workshops and you'd like to somehow organize one, please email us and reach out. Great, thank you. And we've posted the link to the um, student conference on conservation science in the chat there as well, so you all can access that easily. Okay, um, moving on to question 24. How long should Wallace take to spatially thin user input occurrence records? I've noticed that for 2000 records, it takes my computer an hour. When I tried running several thousands, it was done in over nine hours. Yes, I believe I answered that. Um, so Wallace uses the SP thin package for thinning and it's gonna really depend on the package itself. So my question, back to you is have you tried running SP thin directly into R just to know if it's um, related to the package. The speed will really depend on the underlying package and your own computer power but do keep in mind that what SP thin is doing is measuring the distance between your point and all of the other points to make sure that it's not at the minimum distance that you're giving it. And so if you have thousands of points, you can see how you have exponentially um, increased the number of comparisons. And so I would guess it takes a lot of time. That makes sense. Great. Uh, question 25. Um, thank you for your presentation. In the past, I had problems using Wallace with species that have broad distributions or a lot of occurrences fails to build a polygon or to do the SDM, is this something that will change with the new version? Yes, Andrea again here. Um, the new version should prevent many of the gray screens that you might be having, but if this is a problem about your computer power, it might persist. Version 2 does include an option to run models in parallel, which should help with problems of um, computer power, but if it's at the polygon level, um, I don't think it will be fixed. Um, it's probably just need a computer with a bigger RAM. As Erica mentioned, R would allocate everything in the RAM. Okay, great. Question 25, any rule of thumb on minimum occurrence data that can be used in STM, especially Maxent, to get good habitat prediction. Would you still recommend spatial filtering as a way to account for sampling bias when you have few occurrence records, such as less than 20? And is there any other way of accounting for sampling bias that doesn't run the risk of reducing already sparse occurrence records? Yes, I believe um, I answered the first part of this and these other questions were added afterwards, but I'll try my best to answer them. So this is a great question and I don't think there's a super clear cut answer. Um, in general, I think the consensus is like if we have over 30 points, we all feel very comfortable and confident that we can produce a robust model with that. Uh, however, I, I have seen models that are good models built with about 10 points. Um, it's all really dependent on how large your modeling extent is depending you know, in relation to where you have your points. Because one of the things that we're trying to do by evening out um, or thinning out is uh, the occurrence data is to make sure that the environments that the species occupies are equally represented and that we're not weighing some more heavily than others just because of sampling biases. So 
in terms of the spatial filtering when you have few points, well, it really depends on how clustered your points are going to be in relation to the extent that you're going to be modeling to. And if you think that's going to artifactually increase the suitability in certain areas because you have more points in that area. Um, as I said, it's not a really straightforward answer and it takes a little bit of thinking and um, just inspecting and, and knowing the ecology of your species as well, right? Because the, the mobility of your species is also going to be affecting the way that you, you choose the, sam the spinning distance. Um, I'm glad you brought it up and I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for it. Um, I, I think it's still a point of contention and people are still trying to figure it out. Great, thank you. Okay, um, moving on to question 27. Thank you. We, we've been working on crop plagues caused by different insects. Is Wallace suitable to project expansion of insects as well as fungi and bacteria knowing their occurrences? So yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so yes. Yeah. You can absolutely use Wallace or any other SDM approach to model insects or bacteria or fungi. Um, as long as one, you have the occurrence records. And in my experience, that's the hardest part to deal with, especially when you're dealing with um, non-vertebrates. Um, and you know, for some insects, there is a lot of data, but then for others, there is not. Uh, one of the main assumptions is that the distribution of your species, though, is going to be driven mainly by climate. So in my experience, one of the issues here is that, for example, maybe some fungi and bacteria are going to be very closely related to hosts, and maybe it's host distribution that is actually going to be the main driver of their distribution. So if that's the case, then you have to be very careful about the modeling assumptions and make sure that you incorporate some sort of method to include these biotic interactions with like hosts or other species that may be relevant. And I've added a reference here, just one of the very many of how and when you should include biotic interactions in your SDM workflow. Great, thank you, important point there. Okay, uh, question 28. What are the assumptions to take into consideration when using camera trap occurrence points for SDM? Uh, I think I answered this one. This is Mary. So I think the, the biggest consideration here is sampling bias. So if you're using camera drop data, um, you want to be really careful to control the background training extent and maybe just do like buffers around each camera trap um, because your sampling is so restricted. And it would be important to do spatial thinning of points as well. Great, thank you. Yeah, it ties into some of the conversations we were having previously about bias and thinning. Okay, uh, question 29. Can the model be used in crops such as rice or be used to predict microorganism distribution? Hi, yeah, I answered this one, um, Erica here. Um, so kind of related to the question I answered previously about bacteria and fungi. So in theory, yes, you can use this for crops or microorganisms, uh, but kind of the same idea. You have to be very mindful to consider what are the actual drivers of your distribution. So for example, with rice, um, if there's any anthropogenic activity that is changing the local environment, such as irrigation, for example, maybe you would want to include that as a predictor variable. So um, in theory, yes, but you would have to make modifications to actually fit the species that you're interested in. Great, yeah, good points. Okay, question 30. If I have an archive of occurrence data of different species that was taken from November 2017 to December 2020, what date should be the best for environmental variables if I want to upload to Wallace? Oh, this is this is me. Yes. So, um if you're interested in climate variables, you don't have to worry about this too much because those are 30 year averages. Um, but if you are interested in using remote sensing data like forest cover or something or NDVI to inform your model training, you might want to try a median date or year 
or something if, if you want to model all of those occurrence data together. But it would be really important to double check those and make sure, you know, if you have um, an occurrence uh, point from 2017 and then you're using NDVI from 2018 is like the medium, you want to make sure that there wasn't like extreme forest loss that's reflected in the NDVI from 2018 when your species was observed there in 2017 before the forest was cut down. See what I mean? So you just want to double check it. Um, we, we don't do this in Wallace, but you can also do something really fancy in R, which is like a point process model where you could include different environmental variables for each point. So you could match your point from 2017 with the environmental variable for 2017. And et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can also do that with um, SWD format, I guess, in Maxent. And I can't remember if that's something we're doing in, in V2. Andrea, let me know if so. But um, you know, we've had some requests to to think about that. So we might we might think about it some more. Yeah, interesting point. I have not heard of um, doing this point processing model where you can select those different dates. Sounds like something that'd be really useful, especially when um, doing field sampling over multi-year periods like this. Very cool. Um, great. All right. Question 31. If we do not have point occurrence data of species, could we do SDM like, like a study using IUCN distribution data, which is in polygon form? Yeah, this is this is me too. Um, students ask me this all the time. I strongly advise against it. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, many of us who have been a part of IUCN assessments and know how those polygons get drawn would probably say the same. Um, but people do it, and maybe people will take the polygon and like sample random points within it or something. Um, but it just it just adds a, a huge level of uncertainty. Um, but you know it really depends on the question you're asking, right? And the scale that you need to answer your question, uh, and also the resolution of environmental variables that you're you're using. So it might not be terrible depending on all of those things. But I advise you to not do it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, question thirty two. Uh, can Wallace be used to model distributions or predictions for highly mobile species, especially migratory species of birds and fish? This is this is particularly for species that have very poor ecological or biological information. Yeah, I think this is me again. Um, so yes, um, with extreme caution and some thoughtful thoughtfulness about the environmental variables that you're using to train the models or perhaps with some uh, creative ideas about variables that might even capture parts of the migration process. Yes, you can certainly look into it. Um, I've seen folks that do this often have separate models for different seasons, right? Or, or they only model the breeding season, for example, for birds rather than everywhere that that animal has been seen. Uh, but yes, there's a lot of examples of folks doing this, and it can be quite informative and interesting. Very cool. Thank you. And also in session three on Thursday, we'll be talking about um, another model called CircuitScape. It does focus more on the migratory aspects and might be another option to, to look into. We'll talk about that in a little bit more depth on Thursday. Okay, question 33. Is it possible to say that Wallace is a simplified or advanced form of MIA Maxent modular integrated approach to maximum energy distribution modeling? Um, so we're not very familiar with Mia Maxent. Um, we're definitely going to check it out more, but to me, it seems like it's a method. Uh, they're arguing uh, it's a method that is better than Maxent. 
Um, Wallace is not a method. Wallace is able to include many or any modeling technique. Uh, we started with Maxent, but it will be able to incorporate others. Wallace is a platform that allows for best practices to be incorporated in data pre-processing and the model parameterization, uh, which could be applied to any modeling technique, Mia Maxent included. Great, thank you. Okay, question 34. Is it possible to visualize or save response curves? Um, yeah, me again, yes, definitely. In the visualize component, you can look at all the response curves um, one variable at a time, and you can use the download tab in that same component to download all of the response curves uh, at the same time. Great, thank you. Um, and we did have one email question um, that was referencing um, an error about the um, species, uh, finding the species. And the uh, I think the guidance that was given was check GBIF to make sure there are data of species occurrence for that particular species if the spelling is also correct in the model. Um, so I, I did receive that that email question and popped it in there, and we'll include that in the Q and A document as well. Um, so I think that might be uh, the majority of the questions for today, and we are very close to um, the time for the session here. Um, so I think we can go ahead and wrap up for today. Um, I just want to give a huge thank you to um, Andrea, Erica, and Mary for um, the presentation and for joining us today and answering so many of these questions. Um, it's really great to have this engagement with the community and um, you really have some thoughtful responses to all these questions, so very, very helpful. Um, we have also included the um, email address to contact the, the Wallace team at the top of the document and Looks like my colleague is scrolling up here. Um, there's a there's a Google group, so do please um, message the Google group there. There's a lot of information there. Um, and then we've included the, the Wallace email team um, there as well. Yeah, um, there's the Google group as well. And um, yeah, I would just like to, to thank our guest speakers again um, and remind everyone to please join us next session on Thursday, that'll be our final session for this training series. Um, and do please check back on the website for the homework at that point as well. Um, so thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day.